Okay, so welcome everyone. Uh, welcome back to this last session of today. We have two speakers in this last session. The, the first speaker is uh, Albirante. He is a professor of the Department of Mathematics of Antarctic Sciences in uh, George Mason University in, uh, in the US. And he's also the founder and director of the Center for Mathematics and Artificial Intelligence. Also, they are associated with the George Mason University. And he's a well-known expert in optimization, inverse problems, numerical analysis in general, artificial intelligence. And today is going to lecture about, we don't see your uh, slides, Arbil. There you go. OK, thank you. So today is going to lecture us on uh, fractional operators, analysis, and optimal control with physical and data science applications. Uh, so thank you, Umberto, for, for this very nice introduction. I hope I can live up to the expectation. And also thanks to Enrique and Giuseppe for, for organizing this meeting. Uh, I really wish uh, we could uh, meet in Rome, but maybe next time. Uh, I'm, I only been to Rome once. It was a long time ago as a tourist. So it'd be nice to have a scientific visit. So um, as Umberto said, I'm going to discuss uh, some of our work from last uh, few years that we have done uh, on, on fractional operators. And this work is uh, partially supported by National Science Foundation, uh, Air Force Officer of Scientific Research, and Department of Navy, uh, both under our Department of Defense here in the United States. So let me start with uh, some motivation for this, um, for working with, with, with um, the so-called fractional operator. So I like to show this slide because it's, it's uh, quite interesting actually, and, 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 and it's uh, pretty straightforward to see the benefits of using this approach. So if you start with a noisy image uh, given here by F, uh, typically, one uses the so-called total variation um, regularization. Uh, here, I have written, formally speaking, the integral of the L1 norm of gradient of U, but this needs to be really understood in the distributional sense. So, and, and uh, let's assume for the moment that this is really the integral, and you try to write the Euler-Lagrange Euler equations in this case, what you see is a nonlinear set of equations, uh, which um, in general are degenerate as well. And still people are writing papers, uh, especially from, from the numerical point of view, because this is a very delicate object to handle numerically. Um, a few years ago, together with Soren Bartels from University of Freiburg in Germany, we replaced this, um, this total variation semi-norm by this operator delta to the power s over two, where s is uh, an exponent between zero and one. And if you write the equations in this case, the Euler-Lagrange equation is a linear uh, TDE. Now you may say that uh, you replaced a highly nonlinear degenerate model by a linear equation. Uh, does it work? In fact, uh, it's pretty straightforward for the application that I mentioned above. Uh, if you start with a noisy image, uh, the given here the second image F, and you can solve this equation in like 0 0.01 second on, in MATLAB uh, in like five lines of code using just the simple FFT and IFFT. And you get a reconstruction that's given in the middle. The rightmost reconstruction is what you get uh, if you use total variation regular, uh, approach where you even optimize over this regularization parameter alpha. So we notice that, uh, that we are doing actually pretty reasonably uh, compared to the total variation approach, but this approach is very, very simple and also it's um, extremely quick. Uh, of course, we still have to identify these parameters S and alpha as it is uh, in, in, in most of the inverse problems that we know, especially with respect to uh, this exponent S, the problem is um, non-convex. And if you want to impose certain constraints on S, then the problem becomes also non-smooth. It turned out you can you can create actually a, a, a sort of a, a bi-level optimization approach a mo a motivated by, by deep neural networks where you set up a bi-level problem with the outer functional is you're trying to identify the, the exponent S and the regularization parameter alpha. And here I'm looking at a more general um, 
problem where now I have introduced this operator K. Before K was identity for the image denoising problem, but here I'm looking at the so-called tomographic reconstruction problem. Uh, this is a joint work with a former PhD student, Ratna Khatri and uh, uh, Wendy D at Argonne National Lab um, in, in Chicago. So here K for this problem is the radon transform. And uh, we want to solve this bi-level optimization problem because there are two levels. And uh, I don't want to get into too much detail, but just want to emphasize that if you use this fractional Laplacian regularization, uh, regularizer, uh, what you get in terms of so-called signal to noise race ratio, uh, higher the better. And we clearly notice that um, the, the fractional approach, which is the red curve compared to the total variation approach is doing much better. And similarly, in the so-called structural similarity index that uh, people care about in imaging, um, we are also winning. Uh, in this paper, we also, so here I'm, sh I'm showing you um, basically what happens when you vary this, this, this parameter alpha for a fixed uh, exponent S, I think it was like 0.4, but the paper also discusses how do you actually identify uh, S and alpha in, in, in a more mathematical rigorous way uh, using uh, some, some sort of, uh, an, uh, using algorithm motivated by um, some machine learning problems. So we are noticing that uh, in fact, uh, using this fractional Laplacian as a regularizer is not a bad idea uh, because it leads to linear equation and, um, and, and, and it preserves sharp features that we want to preserve uh, when we do uh, reconstructions in, in, in imaging, especially we have seen example with denoising now also with tomographic reconstruction. But we were a bit more greedy. We want to push this further then we were uh, we introduced this new object called delta s of x. Here s is not a constant anymore, but it's a function of x, and we allow it to touch zero and one. So if you start with a noise image like the one on the left, uh, and if you use this approach and you use this fractional Laplacian with variable order as a regularizer, then you can get a reconstruction uh, as you see on the right hand side, almost perfect reconstruction. If you use total variation regularization where you even optimize over the total variation uh, regularization parameter, you get something in the middle, which you notice is um, um, basically the corners are smooth out, which is a known artifact uh, when it comes to total variation re regularization. Uh, we also have an approach actually to identify this, uh, this, this function now as um, the, basic, the basic idea is when you have jump discontinuities, you want to set this S as close as to zero as possible. So you just have L2 functions. And when you're in the flat regions, um, you set S close to one as, um, as, possible, as much as possible. So basically you're enforcing H1 smoothness. And that's why we, all, we see uh, almost a perfect reconstruction. Uh, you can you can do more data science applications related with these operators um, in 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 weather forecasting and 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 in many applications people care about the so-called uh, fractional diffusion maps where you are given a not the fractional diffusion map they care about diffusion maps you are given a cloud of data and you're trying to fit a manifold through the data to understand the structure of the data for instance um, but typically they use the the standard heat kernel, which leads to the Laplacian on a manifold. Uh, but in this article, uh, which is published in ACHA, this Applied and Computational Harmonic Analysis Journal, um, just uh, recently, basically we look at the non-local kernel and try to learn the manifold using non-local kernel. Um, and we notice pretty interesting features because this fractional Laplacian is enforcing low regularity as, as, as we will see shortly. So these are applications from, from the data science point of view, but we also looked at several applications from physics point of view. One application, the so-called magnetolorics, where the goal is to try to identify uh, the electrical conductivity inside the earth uh, from surface measurements. And typically people use so-called Helmholtz equation, right? The standard Helmholtz. Um, in this article, uh, together with a couple of uh, guys from Sandia National Labs, um, in, part, in particular Chad Weiss, he's, he's really a geophysicist. Uh, we started with 3D Maxwell's equations and, and using first principle arguments, we derive um, the fractional Helmholtz equation 
And then we solve this, this, this equation and we plot the so-called apparent resistivity versus uh, frequency. What we notice is that we get these bell-shaped curves um, for different fractional exponents. And the classical case, S equals one is, is well known. And then we were wondering if this actually corresponds to some, some real uh, physical data. And it turned out there are a bunch of these magnetic stations within the United States. Uh, one that's located in Kansas, uh, it's a project funded by NSF. So the data is open source. And we found uh, this data for apparent resistivity versus frequency. This is the actual data. And we noticed that uh, actually, at least qualitatively, our experiment, our numerical ex results matches with the data almost perfectly. So that's uh, quite quite an ex exciting development in the last uh, couple of years. Uh, recently, just like a month ago, we have looked at some more applications of, of these operators uh, with the so-called harmonic maps. So here, um, the typical harmonic map is you're trying to minimize the so-called Dirichlet energy, right? So gradient of U square, and uh, you enforce the constraints that you stay on the surface of unit ball. And this has many applications. Uh, it's really, a, it's a fundamental problem in, in ferromagnetism, in liquid crystals, uh, continuum mechanics, uh, where uh, basically U or V is considered as the director field. And you're trying to enforce this unit length constraints. Um, and also in quantum mechanics for spin systems. I'll show you precisely actually the, uh, really the fractional model appears when you, when you work in, 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 in um, this problem. So joint work with uh, Soren Bartels and uh, from, from Freiburg in Germany and Armin Shikara from, uh, from Pittsburgh. So uh, what are the key difficulties? So here now we, are, we have changed the energy. We are looking at uh, fractional Laplacian energy uh, instead of the standard Richelieu energy. And there is a reason behind that because um, actually you will see that on the next slide. So how do you solve this problem? Typically, you, you create a gradient flow uh, as written here. You take the variation of the energy, uh, write, sorry, uh, write the gradient flow equation, and lambda is a Grange multiplier corresponding to those unit length constraint that I mentioned earlier. Uh, this lambda makes your life quite difficult, actually. It's, um, it turned out this gradient flow equation is highly nonlinear and um, and, 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 and rather challenging to solve. In case, for, for example, S equals one, you notice that lambda is the, uh, just the L1 norm of gradient of U. So, and, and something similar appears in the fractional case as well. Uh, here I have shown two experiments. Um, for S equals 0.4, uh, you start with um, an, a, a boundary condition, X or mod X and uh, as, you, as in the classical case, a point singularity appears. But when S become, when we take S even smaller, we see some known local defects. Um, it turned out this is, um, there are no truly known local defects, at least in this experiment. Um, if you refine the fi uh, mesh that we are using, then this actually um, goes towards a single point as, as it is expected. But using this non-local or, or fractional energy is meaningful because you are working with uh, the problems with singularity. Uh, so classical Dirichlet energy may not be the best model for this. Um, but we still need to, of course, validate our results with actual experiments, which, which uh, we have not done that yet because it's really a um, new work. Another application I mentioned is the so-called quantum spin chains. And here, uh, if you start with actually this model of quantum spin chain introduced by Haldane and Shastri long time ago in, in 88, they really write a discrete model. And if you take a continuum limit of that model, you, you truly arrive at uh, precisely this, this uh, fractional um, half, wave map, half wave map equation. Uh, in, in, in their case, S is uh, one half. Here I'm writing more general equation. And so you can again establish, uh, we have that in our paper, uh, like a numerical scheme and also establish the convergence of your numerical scheme. And here I'm showing you a couple of experiments. In the first experiment, you start with an initial condition um, given like this and 
you basically are uh, just observing the so-called solitary waves uh, if you use such an initial condition. And here I have, this, I have perturbed my standard harmonic map, which is uh, zero cosine X and sine X by a perturbation parameter C. And we see that our configuration goes back and forth between uh, our uh, ideal harmonic map uh, configuration. So it may, it may be a mild, mouthful to, to sort of um, understand in, in, within just one slide. And I, I, I encourage you to look at, at, at our paper but the point is that uh, this, this fractional operator, especially fractional Laplacian, we have seen now applications both from the data science point of view and imaging and also from physics point of view, uh, especially in these quantum spin chains, uh, harmonic maps, and also in, uh, um, in geophysics. So how do you define these operators? So let's, let's start with that. Um, there are various ways of defining these operators. Uh, one example, one, uh, one definition is the so-called um, Dirichlet fraction Laplacian or the spectral fraction Laplacian. If you look at the eigenfunctions and eigenvalues of the standard Laplacian with zero Dirichlet boundary condition, um, you just raise this power um, to S and then you raise the eigenvalues to the power S, you get the so-called uh, spectral fraction Laplacian. And this works in arbitrary domains uh, one thing that I don't like about this definition is that uh, you're enforcing inherently uh, zero Dirichlet boundary conditions, especially when the exponent S is greater than one half. If you want to extend this definition to non-homogeneous boundary conditions, I recommend you to look at our paper in, in communication in math sciences. And the other definition, the so-called integral fraction Laplacian, where you are trying to evaluate this operator applied to you at a point X, but you need the information about about you everywhere in Rn. So it's truly a non-local operator. And also we have a kernel, uh, which could be um, singular that we have to work with. If I replace this Rn by omega, we get the so-called uh, regional fraction Laplacian. So let's look at the most basic boundary value problem corresponding to uh, fraction Laplacian. Um, the classical boundary value problem is just the Laplacian u equals zero in omega, u equals to g on the boundary. And if we try to do the same with this, with this fractional Laplacian or the integral fractional Laplacian, we notice that um, this, this problem is not well posed any longer because the definition requires you to have information about the function everywhere. Uh, the, the truly well-posed problem is you enforce u equals to g in Rn minus omega in the exterior of the domain, uh, which may look uh, a bit strange at, at this point, but I, I will come back to this later on and we'll see that uh, this allows us to introduce a new notion of um, optimal control. One of the key feature of, of this, this fractional Laplacian or, uh, is non-locality as we saw in the definition. The other key, key point is that uh, they are enforcing low regularity. Uh, and that's what we exploited in all those applications that I showed you earlier uh, with harmonic maps and imaging in particular. So uh, here is an example. So if you start with just the Dirichlet problem, uh, smooth omega, a unit ball, uh, smooth right-hand side f equals to one, g equals to zero, then you notice that you can write an explicit solution, but in this case, the, the classical shift theorem does not hold. So classic in the case of classical Laplacian, the right-hand side is an L2, domain is smooth, you get an H2 solution, uh, but that result does not hold in case of fractional Laplacian. So even if you start with a smooth domain, smooth data, you can still have non-smooth solution. And that is uh, that makes the life difficult uh, and also makes this, this type of, um, approach is quite uh, quite more interesting and also amenable to applications where you have some discontinuities. Uh, some solid spaces, um, so the classical stuff, uh, so you can define your classical Sobolevsky space, WSP, uh, functions which are in LP, and this, uh, this Gagliardo semi-norm is uh, finite, and you can correspondingly define your um, norm on the Sobolev space. We, we, we also care about this W tilde space, which are the functions in uh, WS2 
or or HS, which are zero in the exterior of the domain. Um, if I'm working with just the uh, domain omega and look at the interpolation space between H10 and L2, um, this this is basically, uh, this is the space that we use if you use this, um, the spectral fraction Laplacian definition. Now, so this was about uh, some of the applications of uh, fractional operators in particular fractional Laplacian and, 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 and some of the background on, on the definition. So let me discuss some more applications for, for these this operators. One application we saw in the previous talk, uh, um, optimal control problems, right? Uh, there we had uncertainty, um, but so and so so basically everybody is sort of well versed with with optimal control problems at this point because of previous talk. But let me uh, recapitulate. So trying to match some data, let's say u sub d, and this is just an example of an objective function, and you have some PDE constraint. You can have a semi-linear PDE, for example, or it could be other type of no, non-linear PDE. But the control here is on the on the on the right hand side. You could have uh, the spectral fraction Laplacian or the integral fraction Laplacian. Uh, the goal is to match u with u d with the help of the control variable uh, z. Uh, it's a delicate problem actually. Just one thing that you need to show is that the solution is bounded um, with appropriate regularity on z, and you're not allowed to assume too much regularity on z. Uh, this can be done using the classical Stampaki argument, but that needs to be um, our, that argument needs. We had to redo the argument, especially uh, for these non-local operators. Uh, you can find details uh, in in these two papers in um, ECM M two AN and uh, COCV. All right. So here, uh, recall the control is on the right hand side. What about the control on the boundary? If you use the spectral fraction Laplacian, this can be done actually relatively easily. It's not a, a big deal, um, especially if you use um, this, this, this paper of ours where we extended the spectral definition to a non-homogeneous boundary condition. Now, what about the integral fraction Laplacian? I mentioned earlier, uh, here you need to impose the conditions in the exterior of the domain, uh, which uh, looks rather strange, but it in allows you to introduce a new notion of optimal control. So if you have some diffusion going on uh, or some anomalous diffusion or fractional diffusion going on in this domain, typically the control is placed either in the interior or on the boundary. But with this approach, we can actually uh, put a control which is far away. So, um, so there is that flexibility. Uh, in in if if you if you want to know more about this, uh, the elliptic case is considered in this paper, um, it, which is published in Inverse Problems, and the parabolic case is considered in, in the second paper. Um, one of the key challenge here was how do you um, work with just the L two controls? You need to know you need to, you need to have the proper notion of very weak solutions. Um, and also, we were more interested in developing numerical algorithm to solve this problem, and how we deal with that. Um, basically, the, the 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 goal is to approximate. Uh, the idea was to approximate the uh, Dirichlet solutions using Robin solutions. Uh, you can find all the details in these two papers, actually. So here uh, we are talking about uh, cont optimal control problems. Uh, we are allowing constraints on the control. That's why I, I have uh, Z in Z sub AD. So we can have um, Z or the control variable in a closed convex set. But in many applications, uh, you're also interested in state constraint problems. So for instance, you don't want your temperature to cross a certain threshold. And that makes the problem uh, more, more interesting and, and quite challenging. Um, so we still have uh, an optimization problem subject to a PD constraint. And uh, for simplicity, I'm going to assume the control is on the right hand side. If I try to impose these um, constraints on my state that it does not constrain, uh, um, it does not violate or cross a certain bound U sub B in, in a certain solute space, then it turned out that uh, we cannot fulfill in general um, 
constrained qualifications. Typically, people impose this inequality constraint in, in the set of continuous functions, but that causes further problems because the Lagrange multiplier corresponding to this inequality constraint is, is it turned out to be a measure. And um, so basically with a measure on the right hand side, um, we did that, it's, it's published in these, these two papers. Um, I mean, there, are, there is a lot more that, that, that goes in to study this problem. One thing is you need to establish that the solution to this PDE is um, continuous uh, with, with minimal regularity on the right hand side. So we assumed, if you assume that uh, the right hand side is in LP with P greater than N over two S, the classical case is S equals one. If P is greater than N over two, you can show that the solution to this equation is continuous. Um, and we extended that to the fractional case. And we did that for parabolic problem as well. Uh, there you need to account for both integrability in time and also in, 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 in space uh, and work with these Bachner spaces. All right, so this was about um, two types of optimal control problem. Uh, so we looked at the, 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 the control constraint problems and also state constraint problems. Uh, but in all these problems, I assume that the fractional exponent was given to us. But if we don't know about fractional exponent, so what do we do? Um, one way to model that is we model that as a random variable. And this sort of ties back to the previous talk that we heard. Uh, but this is a slightly different problem. And I'll explain why. So now my S is a random variable. So my objective function becomes a random variable. We can scalarize the objective function by taking the expected value as was mentioned in the previous talk, but here we are working with general risk measures. Um, an example of risk measure is uh, mean plus MI deviations. We are trying to minimize the deviations above, the, above or below the mean value. Other example is so-called entropic risk or the conditional value at risk, uh, which I didn't really write here. So uh, the key difference between this problem and, and what exists in the literature is, uh, now you're looking for solutions to this PDE in a, in a solute space, HS, but S is a random variable. So the regularity of your solute space is changing. Um, and how do you get around that? Um, it's tricky, actually. And this is the, the details can be found in, in this uh, SIM control and optimization paper, which just appeared um, this year, together with uh, Drew Curry from Sandia National Lab and uh, Johannes Pfeffer from uh, Technical University Munich. So we have some other works related to these problems uh, on how do you create multigrid methods to solve optimal control problems. Um, it's a joint work with Andre Dragonescu uh, from, from University of Maryland, Baltimore County, and a, and a former PhD, not a former, actually current PhD student, uh, Kiefer Green. Uh, we were also looked at more general problems uh, like fractional P Laplacian, for instance, and how do you identify the coefficients in, in in these pro those problems within optimal control setting. We also looked at some, some variational inequalities or in particular quasi-variational inequalities, which are more challenging in, in, in couple of papers. And we have effic uh, um, efficient methods to solve these problems, um, let's say using so-called reduced basis method. All right, so, so this was about optimal control problem. Um, now, let me uh, say a few words about this new object that I introduced at the beginning of the talk, which was the fractional Laplacian with the variable exponent S. And I applied that to an imaging uh, application and we saw that we can do almost perfect reconstructions. So what is this object? So let's recall our uh, imaging problem, uh, which was we are given a noisy image F and we're trying to reconstruct V. And uh, and this is this was the regularizer that we had, uh, the fractional Laplacian regularizer. Now we wanted to make this s as a function of x, and we wanted to allow it to touch zero and one, the extreme cases. So when you have jump discontinuities, you set s to uh, zero, and in the flat regions you set it uh, to one. And it it was actually not trivial. How do you define uh, such an operator? And it, it took us a while. Uh, the approach we took is the so-called uh, extension idea. So if you, are domain, if you are in domain omega, you add one more dimension to this domain. 
uh, let's call that um, the so-called cylinder. So it's omega cross zero infinity. And we're trying to match u with f at the bottom of the cylinder. In this extended cylinder, uh, we consider, so if we take theta equals to zero, just the Dirichlet energy, but with a certain weight, why is the variable in this extended direction? Now, if you take S to be uh, strictly constant, then it turned out that this problem is exactly equivalent to the original problem in defining the domain omega. This is a result of uh, Caffarelli and Sylvester in Rn and the bounded domains it's by uh, Pablo Stinga and, and, and Torea from Spain. Stinga is at Iowa State. But now we don't have S a constant, but it's a function of X and we allow it to touch zero and one. And that makes the analysis extremely, extremely challenging. And I'll give you an example. So the, the solid space that you consider to study that problem is H1 with a weight. Um, delta was one minus two S of X, right? Um, and if S is a constant, it, you can show that this weight Y delta fulfills the so-called uh, Mokinhoff property uh, quite well known in harmonic analysis. And if that's the case, then you can prove that the smooth functions are dense in your sublime space. And you can do all your classical PD arguments that um, um, that you prove something for smooth functions and by density, everything holds. But since we want S to touch zero in, in, in view of our applications, we jump discontinuities, it turned out that this Y delta is not uh, does not belong to this, the so-called Mokinov class. And it's not clear if the smooth functions are dense or not. So we cannot use any of the classical arguments from PDEs by density. So we had to go around that and that's made uh, things more, more, more challenging for us. Uh, first thing we established was a new type of trace theorem for this uh, weighted solute space. Um, trace is not, ju not just L2, but it's a weighted L2 space. We can now also characterize almost the range of this space in a new paper, um, which we just submitted actually, and currently it's in review. So let's apply this S of X again to an, uh, another application um, related to imaging. I showed you that triangle, square, and circle example earlier. So if you start with a noisy image as given here, uh, the recovery you can do with, it, with this, this SX approach is the one at the bottom right. The one at the bottom left is uh, the recovery you do if you use the, the total variation approach where you even optimize over the parameters. Uh, what these imaging people care about is the so-called SSIM or the subtle similarity index. Uh, with this new approach, we, we have like 0.8, and here is like 0.74. Uh, you may note this number, this difference might does not um, may not seem that high actually at first, but in 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 fact, it's it's hard to really improve this further. Remember, higher the better. So I don't know how much time I have, Umber though. You have five minutes left, Arbil. I see. So just want to summarize actually, uh, I mean, I, I, I have a lot more to say. I have, I have more slides, but I didn't know how much time I would have. So I started with uh, several applications related to imaging, also geophysics, uh, diffusion maps and harmonic maps. Uh, also quickly gave you an overview of uh, what's known now in, on, on the optimal control of such PDEs, in particular semi-linear problems and quasi-linear problems with the fractional pill Laplacian uh, control from outside was the exterior optimal control uh, state constraints. I also gave uh, a quick overview on risk covers optimal control problems and it discussed in more detail, details this delta S of X. And there is another operator that, um, that I wanted to discuss today, but I think I will not get into that because of time constraints. I don't want to flip through the slides. I will, sh I will share all the slides. So, so if you're interested, you can have a look later on. Um, uh, that's the so-called fractional time derivative. And uh, we use that in the context of machine learning and, and, and it, it, it's, it has worked extremely well actually, in particular to solve um, a class of problems like parameterized PDEs, for example, like say C is your parameter, could be a random variable. 
then how do you approximate the solution to this PDE uh, um, efficiently? People use a reduced basis method, for instance, but for nonlinear problems, it turned out that reduced basis method in general is intrusive, but with this, uh, this sort of neural network approach using fractional uh, operators, it becomes a completely non-intrusive approach. Um, all right, I think I will uh, stop here. And we also looked at um, applications related to chemical reacting flows. Uh, these are um, very challenging problems where you need to solve a coupled system of fluid dynamics equations uh, combined with uh, many, um, many ODEs describing the reactions. And these ODEs are uh, stiff ODEs. Um, it's an extremely challenging problem actually that, and that uh, many, many people care about. In particular, one example is combustion, for instance. Uh, I'll be happy to discuss more detail on that uh, if you're interested, but I'll stop here. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Arbil, for this very nice talk. So if anybody has questions or comments. Sorry, Harvey, I have a, a very, very naive question. I think it was in, in page eight or so when you have shown uh, a model for some magnetic vector field or so, yeah, in which you you were considering, well, it was the one before actually, yes. Yeah. The, the next one, maybe. This, this one, yeah. yeah. So uh -huh. then, so then the, the previous one, please. Ah, uh, sorry, okay. This sorry. one. Okay. So here you are dealing with a heat-like equation when and you are imposing the restriction that the vector field point wise right has to be correct. equal to one correct. yeah correct so then then you are solving the equation with image in the sphere and then you say because of this you need a lagrange multiplier okay that's fine and analytically well i suppose uh, so is that an easy problem to show that there is existence and uniqueness uh with this constraint or and no, my actually. question was more uh, numerically, right? So how do you, uh, this reminds me a little bit what Dogman Co was telling this morning about a, collect, a collective dynamics model in which uh, he was dealing with, uh, you know, uh, motion of particles uh, on a manifold. And then the, the difficulty was dealing with the constraint that uh, the manifold introduces, right? So this uh, point-wise hard constraint of being on taking values in the sphere. Right. So, um, so first of all, an analytically, uh, so, I'll, so I'll comment on both analytical aspects and the numerical aspect. Analytically, problem is extremely challenging, actually. There is a lot of uh, work that came out of the NYU group on, on, on such problems with standard Laplacian because of the number of applications that this model has. In general, the, the continuous problem has in, is, has, um, is non-unique. Um, you, can, you can show that, actually, with a simple example. Uh, what we do at, at, the, at the discrete level is uh, we violate this constraint slightly. So we do controlled uh, we, we, we do controlled violations. So we, we violate it up to the uh, error of our time step tau. So and if, if you do that, then you can show existence of solution to the discrete problem using a fixed point type argument actually. And then we can also establish, um, um, actually, this was the key point of this paper. We establish uh, at the continuous level an, a new type of compactness result. Um, and it's, it's, it's a very difficult compactness result because as you see, as, as you clearly pointed out, you have lambda, which has a gradient of u times u. So you have, you have multi multiplication of sequences. So you cannot just use the standard compactness and talk about convergence of your discrete scheme. So so we, we first at the continuous level, we have established this, this compactness result. And then at the discrete level, we introduce this numerical algorithm um, that requires you to solve a linear equation at every iteration. So it's an iterative method. And we are violating the constraints up to an order tau, where tau is the time step. But um, we, we show that the algorithm converges um, as, as the number of iterations goes uh, to infinity. And then we and and by using the, that compactness result that we proved at the continuous level, which also extend to the discrete level, we can show actually that uh, you 
um, as you are as you take tau to zero, you convert to the to a solution to the continuous problem. Thank you, thank you, Harvir. Okay, do we have any other question or remarks for Harvir? Uh, we have something in the chat. No, just. Uh, Okay, then if we have no further question, I will thank again Albir for his nice talk. Thank you, thank you, Umberto. Thanks, thanks to the organizers. Okay, so we skip to the to the next speaker, to the last speaker of today, actually, Professor Belomo. Are you ready? Oh, yes, I am. There is uh, Giuseppe who should um, okay. upload uh, my slides. Okay. okay, perfect. We see them. Yes, perfect for me. So this is a teamwork. Yes, yes. Collaboration. So, so Nicola, are you saying something about the soccer match, or or you are also <laughs> you know you want to you stay know, on, the, on the same side? Huh? Because I have very many colleagues who are in Spain, and some of them are also very friend, friend with me, very friendly. I have my well, actually, you are in the Universidad de Granada now, right? Universidad de Granada. Yeah, so this is a conflict of interest. Definitely, definitely. Yeah. Okay, but, so... But, for uh, only for this time, uh, Forza Azzurri. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we will not say Juan Soler, right? So, I mean, we will no, cut this you, from you the can record. Do that. Uh, okay. It was, uh, it yeah. was uh, really um, pulling my leg when, when, uh, when Spain got 4 0 against I see. Italy. So, uh, I don't know. Anyway, Let's see this evening. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Nicola. Thank you. This evening. Okay. Can I start? Yeah. Okay. Let me introduce you, please. So, we are back right to the last talk of this uh, session today. Our speaker is uh, Professor Nicola Bellomo from University of uh, Granada, is a distinguished professor in the University of Granada in Spain and a uh, emeritus professor in uh, the Polytechnic University of Torino in Italy. Well, I think you all know him. He has a, an astonishing research career started more than 40 years ago, who made him also been the, among the highly studied researchers in mathematics in uh, in the web of science, in the 1% of the most certain researchers in the world in mathematics since uh, 2014. And he has been also for a long time president, the president of the Italian Society of Industrial and Applied Mathematics, where he's a well known expert in uh, modeling, analysis, simulation of complex models, and uh, well, in ma applied mathematics, uh, mathematics and uh, mathematical physics in general. And today is going to lecture in us about modeling virus pandemics by multi-scale methods. Well, thank you. They're too kind uh, on, with me, but uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers, uh, Giuseppe and Enrique, huge work and uh, high level contribution. Thank you and uh, congratulations. Uh, this, uh, this, um, these lights and work have been developed in collaboration with two young uh, co-workers of mine, Diletta Burini and Nisreen Otada. Next. So I've, I've divided in three parts my presentation. The first part deals with uh, modeling research plan and modeling strategy. Then I go to the mathematics derivation of models, which are going to be multi-scale. And then I would like to, to show some, some simulation, which, simulations which make 
uh, our, in our days, every day when you open a newspaper, you find something about uh, the future revolution of this uh, disease. So this simulation show you will aims at showing you well some some predictions can be effectively achieved by by mathematical models. I will stay on concept on concept and uh, I, uh, my my I'm not an expert in control theory, so there will not be any control theory in my talk. But my, my hope is not to convince you that I've done a good job on COVID-19 simulation. But uh, more important is that mathematical theory of control can effectively contribute a lot on this topic, as far as the model is effectively reliable. And we are in a in a, con, a, a com, complex, a complex connected world. Next, please. Well, this is important to know that uh, we have some some main reference. The first one is a, a voluntary research promoted by the Royal Society in UK. And we were in charge in the in-host modeling. The team was coordinated by my colleague and friend, Mark Chaplin. And actually, the, having worked in this team has given very many idea, ideas to our approach, which was mainly developed in the following paper. Uh, with very many authors, uh, very unusual for a mathematician. Uh, in, on the other hand, uh, this is an, a, in an, an interdisciplinary paper, and we added to a few mathematicians, applied mathematicians, uh, some virologists, say Bingham and Twarok, uh, an immunologist, Guido Forni, and two economists, uh, Bingham and Virgil Lito, in addition to uh, Damian Knopov, now in BCAM, and he is in, was in charge about simulation. And then uh, this topic has been uh, with, has been developed with my co-workers uh, in two papers. One is submitted and one is in progress, and will be delivered in a, in a Newton Institute meeting very soon. Next, please. Next, okay. So if the strategy, well, the strategy is also too, mu too much time to, to describe a strategy, but I want just to, to enlighten a few key points. First of all, with this kind of, of interactions between mathematics and in this case, biology, virology and immunology, mathematicians cannot develop, in my personal opinion, of course, can, cannot develop a standard standalone approach. The interdisciplinary vision is absolutely necessary. Then in doing so, we should go far beyond the deterministic population dynamics. Why? Well, the, the, the uh, people in, 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 uh, in a population which is subject to the attack of, of the virus are strongly heterogeneous. Uh, heterogeneity in many sense in the age, but also in the ability of the immune de defense, because the system is, uh, uh, the, the, the overall system needs a multi-scale vision of two scales which constantly interact. We have the humans, the humans of a population which make a sort of large scale, while the small scale is of the 
enhanced dynamics. So what up is happening in the lung is uh, at a very low scale of, uh, of uh, partic virus particles, uh, cells of the immune system, somehow related to the molecular skin. But uh, I trust, I trust that mathematical models, once they account the overall complexity of the system under consideration, then can really contribute to crisis managers to take decisions. Most some of the decisions are nowadays at least 50-50 scientific political. Sometimes politics takes the, the place of science and can even show uh, emerging behaviors which were not observed before. So if we can go to the next, uh, the next slide. Well, this is important to see because you see, it gives an idea of the complexity of the interaction network. We have a healthy people who can be subject to vaccination. And then we have uh, the, uh, the inlet and outlet due to either to, uh, to long range networks, but also short range networks, which contribute to the infections. Once the people get infected or arrive infected, this is dynamical, this is transportation. Then the in-host competition, which is, which is the, key, the key problem in this dynamics, may generate people who recover, people who get hospitalized, and those who die. So the, the, all of these actions can be subject to a control, say vaccination, vaccination is not only a vaccine, but also a vaccination program, but also the short range networks can be controlled by locking and the locking dynamics and more difficulties when it is hospitalized because that is the strong, strong interaction with medicine by biology. But even if we don't go there, then we have topics which deserve attention and are waiting for the contribution of expert in control theory. Please, next one. So uh, the strategy is also based on the idea that we cannot use, uh, cannot use standard methods valid for the inert matter. So we need a, a new vision promoted by a Nobel Prize, Lee Hartwell, and which is now in the framework of the so-called science of living systems, which are complex and behavioral by definition. We live in a complex society and an effort has been done some years ago in this book. Next, please. Uh, also, just to close this presentation, sometime we read even on the newspaper the, constant, the use of the term black swan, a highly improbable event, but uh, once, uh, once uh, uh, discovered, uh, it, it appears more, uh, more predictable than before. Well, uh, actually, this is, uh, uh, it became small, maybe uh, I cannot operate on that. Sorry, sorry, please a moment. Okay. Uh, okay.
Sorry. Okay, thank you. Just to say that actually it is not a black swan because it was predicted by several people, including the big name Bill Gates. But uh, uh, it is something else, and I want to. I will go back to this matter uh, later. Please, in the next slide. So let's move to the mathematical approach, the modeling approach. Next, please. So we have, we have a population of individuals, say that their name, name is N0, and a small number of them is infected. We refer not to the number, but to the ratio of the various population which are generated by the, by the interactions and the infections. And uh, <clears throat> so that we have quantities in the range zero, one. This is also helps the, the difficulty of dealing with small and large numbers. Contagion depends on the contact the, the level of the contact, uh, the frequency of the contact, but uh, with then uh, the level of physical protection, which means uh, the, the so-called uh, uh, distance between the in individuals, the social defense against the, the others. But what is, um, what is important is to say that the competition in, in the lung or in, in other parts of the body, uh, mainly in the lung, but not only in the lung, between the proliferative virus and the immune system, uh, is, is strongly related to the level of, of infection. And the level of infection is affecting the probability of infection. So we have uh, uh, this, the level of infection is called what is called a, a viral charge. And this, a, a, the viral charge is a, a dynamic, a dynamic uh, variable which generates at a low scale, but acts on the high scale of individual. Please, the next one. So here I will, I will uh, go somehow fast. Uh, I can uh, divide the system into five uh, subpopulation, which in the theory of living systems are called functional subsystems. One means uh, free, in, uh, susceptible, but, uh, but not infected. Then uh, they become infected too. Uh, maybe uh, infected, but not, not uh, showing that. Three, when they show it. Four, when they need uh, hospitalization. And then we also have, uh, we, we have a person who recover and uh, or, or those who unfortunately die. So we will uh, forget for the moment about the hospitalization. And so we uh, care about knowing the, the number of infected and the number uh, of people who recover and those who die. Each individual is carrier of two variables, two, two micro variables. One is the, the variable related to the progression of the, of the virus. And the other one is the activation of the immune system, which activates from the uh, sentinel level when, when the presence of the virus is discovered in this case, almost immediately, not in, as in nasty case uh, like cancer when it, the discovery is very slow. So next, please. So, well, I, I skip over the technical details and I, I only mentioned that uh, each functional subsystem is represented by a probability distribution over the microscopic scale. Uh, we have avoided to the continuous representation also because I mean, 
it's it's a representation is put in question when the number is not large enough. And on the other hand, it's also very difficult or impossible to identify. While if we take discrete variables, we get the same advantages and, and at the same time, we don't have the, to, to, to discuss about the critic, criticity of the continuity assumption. Then we move to the number density by uh, summing or contribution of this probability distribution. So next, please. Well, this is just to show you the structure, the structure of the equation, because the main idea of the, of the approach is that uh, we should start from uh, a general equation suitable to capture the complexity features of the system under, under consideration. And then we implement in this structure the model, phenomenological models of the interactions. So out of this uh, machinery, we, uh, we uh, can, have, can have a mathematical model. Please, the next one. Uh, so, well, this is more or less already said. I just uh, add that, uh, that uh, we include the onset of variance, which is one very worrying problem in, in our in these days, and the transition across uh, uh, functional subsystems because uh, the variants may are generated, for instance, by the primary virus, the, who is already a variant by of the virus uh, who was uh, located in some uh, some animals. But uh, the new variants are those generate generate uh, uh, within humans. So this figure uh, shows uh, how how the competition acts. Uh, the immune system act over a certain, the, these, fun, uh, these uh, functional subsystems which correspond to the level or a certain level of, of infection and reduces it, contributes to reduce it because it weakens the virus, which on the, and uh, also on the other one, which, <laughs> the higher one which moves into the lower one. On the other hand, the opposite action is applied by the virus progression, the action of the virus, which act, act over either non-infected and who become infected and infected who become uh, are more highly infected, of course, uh, in a discrete representation. Next, please. So we have the mo mathematical model. This mathematical model accounts uh, for all uh, uh, the description, the description that we, we uh, I mentioned before, has nothing to do with the CIR model, the, everyone talks about this model, our, our uh, interest. So we have to see whether this, uh, this, uh, this uh, big uh, system of equation is interesting use for uh, stimulation. Please see the next one. What is a black swan? Is a, is a, is not a black swan, but the component of the more fragile. Our, the system where we live is fragile everywhere. And so we have to take into account these also in our models, the climate models, but in this case, pandemic models. Next one, please. So we've ne never mentioned about, about simulation in a crowd because in a crowd, the people uh, approaches uh, in exchange. This is 
it's taken into account, but they cannot really give details on, on, this, on this part. It would take too much time. So we can move to the other one, to the next one. So we, we have a model, the one we saw before, it accounts for the contagion parameter, which is, uh, which is um, uh, depending on time, because it's not uh, something which is constant in time, but uh, it's something which also depends on the level of locking and the locking which is applied. Then uh, the progression of the virus is made only by one parameters and K kappa or K uh, um, gives you, is, uh, defines the ratio between the progression and the uh, immune defense. Of course, uh, we have to consider heterogeneity of the immune defense and uh, the, the fact that the progression uh, in the new variants is going to be higher than, uh, than the previous one. And that was mentioned by the parameter lambda in the previous, uh, I have forgotten to put it in this slide. And then we are interested to understand the role of the locking and the locking parameters and uh, also, the time when this, uh, this locking, the locking uh, is applied and how it is applied, this is, can become a challenging control problem. Uh, next one, please. Next slide. So what happens uh, in the first when we, the first wave, we know that the wave we have been uh, we have been uh, reading about waves any time. If uh, if once once uh, uh, the crisis managers realize that there is an infection, they impose impose a a locking. Namely, they reduce the parameter alpha from the maximum possible value, the one we can have in a mistake at night, and to a much lower level. And we observe that then the virus anyway infects a lot of people, but the locking after a certain time reduces the number, the number of infected reduces, but not to zero, not to zero. Even if it is very close to zero, the virus is circulating and uh, may start again, as it does in the second wave. So let's uh, move to the next slide. So the second wave is when, after the locking, we apply a delocking. Sometimes people say, well, the virus is disappeared, so we can re return back to maximal freedom. Well, it's not so. It's not so because a small number of infected people make the second wave, the second wave start. And of course, the, the peak of the wave depends on the level of the the locking, the more we increase the alpha parameters and the more we risk a very high wave, which can be worse than the first one, which is exactly, exactly what we had. In this, uh, in this story, our parameters provide, provide a scenario, the scenario of all possible situations and uh, and then uh, uh, we have, however, the problem of scaling the time. This is a scale the time, and this can be done only on uh, on uh, experimental empirical data by empirical data. Of course, we can have by a strong locking a second wave, which is say less uh, dangerous than the previous one. Okay, please next one. 
Okay, what happens with the variance? Well, if we have uh, the present, a small presence of variance, then the behavior during the first locking is somehow, is somehow uh, equivalent to say the, 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 the new variance keeps controlled by the, by, by the locking. But when we move to the, the locking, and we inc increase uh, the parameter defense parameters, then the second vari virus expands, increases, and takes the pl place of the primary virus. The locking, the locking is, however, very much uh, useful in the end. The problem is that it's very unpleasant and also economically expensive. But the second, the second, the variant is more, uh, is, uh, much more disappointing than the third, the first one. And we can have a third one and a fourth one. And uh, if the onset of variance depends on the number of infected people because it's a probability of a mistake of the DNA replication. When this mistake, there are many mistakes uh, in, the, in the replication, some of them create a weaker virus who disappear rapidly, and the other one, a, a, a variant which is more aggressive, and in this, in this respect, in the situation we where we cannot, cannot live our life under locking forever, then uh, the only exit we, we can figure out is the vaccine. But vaccination is a, a, needs a program. And if it is too slow, it's not sufficient. And because new variants may appear. So, uh, Next one, please. Next. Okay, this is more or less the same, uh, the same representation. So this gives the number of dead people and, and shows how during the second wave, you can have a number of dead people, which is uh, in this specific case is worse than, than the first one. Okay, next one. So, well, a research perspective, I just mentioned two. The first one is that we should study what's happening inside the lung, not just the competition homogeneous in lung, because the, there is a propagation in, in the lung and the, the, red, the red alveoles are those who get uh, less elastic and create a rupture of the, of the lung, which is a very bad, very bad meal for the, for the, for the patient. Uh, but the most important thing is, in my opinion, is now is that we need a mathematical theory of mutating virus, progressing mutating viruses. This uh, theory is not yet um, available. Uh, well, my contribution is only a first step towards this challenging, challenging uh, objective. But if we want to achieve uh, that, please, the next one, uh, next slide, we must operate in a network where uh, different expertises interact. This is not easy at all. Uh, this is uh, it's also expensive. And uh, I do, um, I just try to say that um, a, a big center can do that. A research center can do that. Academy is too weak, too fragile to try to put together all these people uh, and to move towards the theory. Next one. So just to conclude, 
I thank again Enrique and Giuseppe. I thank the audience who was uh, patient to, to listen my communication, which was not on control theory. And uh, those, for those who are interested in the mathematical uh, description uh, of living systems, in the University of Granada, there is an open source, is a, 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 a course, is a, is a, is a, a course of lectures given for young researchers by this, uh, this team who has produced uh, these, uh, these lectures. It's, you can access to that, it's free. You just receive, uh, register, and then you can download the, lecture, the text of the lecture. It's not, so, it's not going to survive for a long time because in this fall, it will be completely updated. So thank you to everyone once more. Thank you, Professor Bellomo, for the nice talk. So, we have any questions or comments for the, for the speaker? Just a curiosity. Mm. Abba, uh, can I? Yeah, yeah. Please go ahead. Uh, about uh, the um, control problem for uh, this uh, very nice model, uh, there are uh, already some uh, uh, group that uh, work with you in. Um, no, actually, no. No, I, I cannot lead a group, a team with, uh, with uh, people to do mathematical control uh, as simply as I'm, I'm not a, an expert in the field. Because it's very interesting. Uh, there are uh, different parameters uh, like in... in yes, one, one can start by, I can only say what should be done. Simplify a little bit the model to, to, to focus on some specific. And then, for instance, uh, use the, the, the locking and the locking as a, as a, a control parameter, as a function of, of time. When, when we listen politicians talking, they, they say, well, we will go uh, gradually with, well, we can, we want freedom. I, uh, uh, we want to, to to return as as soon as possible to normal life. And other ones say no, but you must be cautious. Uh, well, this is the problem of planning the locking the locking. Okay, and that, another another problem is the vaccination program. How should be developed? as much as possible, well, uh, it, is, uh, um, it, is, it is not always technical possible, so you have a, an upper bound in some, in some sense, but which one you should uh, vaccinate, the more fragile first, uh, and, and so on, so you can construct uh, a control problem, but once you mathematician has figured out something, then he should first listen uh, virologists and immunologists who give, uh, who give uh, some, uh, some uh, information, some suggestion, and, uh, and also <coughs> create crisis manager, but then, uh, then the really expert in control theory, is not my case, should build up a project of model of control and then, and then, and then work out the mathematics. Okay. Thank you. 
Uh, do, you, do we have any other question for Professor Bellomo? May I ask a question? Yeah, of course, please. Uh, so many thanks for your uh, interesting talk. And, and uh, uh, I would like to ask you uh, uh, whether could you uh, modify and uh, adapt your model in order to take into account of the vaccination of people? Yes, we, we have already some results. I will not, uh, I will not, uh, have not presented them because we are, I, we have to, 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 we have the model, we have to, to focus the, the correct simulation. I hope to, to have them uh, in, uh, in one month's time when, uh, when I will deliver a lecture in the Newton Institute. And then uh, there will be a special issue uh, of the philosophical translation where we will present the results uh, on the vaccination. And uh, can I stress that in my opinion, vaccination is the real key feature of the control problem. Because the other one, say locking, the locking is too much infected by politics. <laughs> Yes. You can make a beautiful control theory, but then it will not be successful <laughs> in practice. But vaccination, yes, vaccination yeah. can be, hopefully. Yes. Many, thank you. Thank you. Okay, any other question? Okay, then if not, let's thank the speaker again. And I come back to Giuseppe for the closing of the of today's session. Okay, thank you. And thank you to everyone and all the friends I've seen on the screen of the participant. Thank you, Professor Bellomo and uh, Professor Andil for um, the nice conference. Uh, tomorrow we start again, but uh, I underline tomorrow uh, we start at nine, at 9 a.m. Uh, with the professor of Baldinoci uh, and uh, um, um, tomorrow is the last day of this six days of uh, workshop, William workshop, the first part in blended mode and uh, this last part uh, only online. Thank you again for uh, the participation. See you tomorrow at 9 a.m. Central European Summer Time. Thank you for, for your participation.